Hi there. So we're in key area seven of unit three, uh, neurobiology and immunology. And we again, we are nearly there. All that happens after this is a very short clinical trials video. And then we are done the whole of higher human biology. Uh, so let's get into what we're looking on. This one is vaccination program. Okay, so vaccination programs are uh, community, not community, but also like medical initiatives to get large numbers of people vaccinated. So they're designed to establish herd immunity, which was talked about in the previous video. Health professionals and government officials and basically people who understand about epidemiology, they aim to get slightly more than the herd immunity threshold vaccinated in order to confidently establish herd immunity. So the idea is if you need exactly 82% of the population vaccinated, you're going to want to aim for slightly more than that because, you know, a lot of the epidemiology work is saying, well, we've got an 82% chance of this. So the more people that you get vaccinated, again, the less the chance of mass outbreaks happening. Okay, so there are some problems with these programs. So mass, va mass vaccinations tend to have two main problems. The first one being that poverty in developing countries can obviously mean that they might not get the vaccine because it's too expensive. So if your country doesn't have enough money to get the vaccines, then you can't get the vaccines. And that's obviously a massive problem with this whole scenario. And also the other problem, which is becoming more and more as we kind of come through time and into the 21st century, is um, the idea of people known as anti-vaxxers, so people who are, are saying actually no to vaccines for various different reasons that they have, but the idea is that they are rejecting to get the vaccine. So that is more and more people saying, I'm not going to get a vaccine, which then really, really affects... The, the mass or the herd immunity and um, when a lot of people aren't getting vaccines. So we're going to cover one specific example of this. Now, this is not something that's going to be in the exam. So you're not going to get asked about the MMR or Andrew Wakefield uh, at all or anything like that. I can't say his name without gagging slightly. Um, but yeah, when you're not going to get asked about that. But you need to have an understanding of the overall idea of what happens when vac uh, vaccines are not taken up. OK, so in this example, we're going to look at the MMR controversy. So uh, in 1998, a scientific pub paper was published in the medical journal The Lancet. Now, Lancet it was a very is a highly respected medical journal. So somewhere where scientists publish their research and it's largely undertaken that the research that's published in there is as close to facts as we can possibly get. The authors of the article thought that the MMR vaccine could damage the bowel and what that did was allow toxins that are normally destroyed during digestion to move into the blood and if they travelled in the blood and go to the brain they might cause autism. So essentially this person was saying that the MMR vaccine might cause autism. It was only later released in the papers of the, that the author published that he had taken a tiny sample size, a small group of children at a birthday party primarily made up of autistic children. So that's essentially like saying, OK, I want to find out if there's a link between spoons causing, I don't know, peanut allergy and me going to a convention with a bunch of peanut allergists and watching them all eat cake with a spoon and going, aha, I have made science. That's bad. That's not good. OK, so as a result of his bad science, the uptake rate of the MMR vaccine dropped dramatically. And this is still having a direct impact on measles outbreaks. And this guy is still floating about on media platforms and social media talking about that he knows better than every other scientist and doctor that's out there. OK, the media got hold of this article and instead of actually, you know, sort of largely fact checking and making sure that what they were doing was was right, they decided to publish very alarming looking headlines. So if you look at these headlines, what you can see is just, you know, I, I understand that if you read a paper and you see that you, you again, you trust the paper, you trust the newspaper that it's not printing absolute rubbish. And so you see headlines like that. That's that's genuinely worrying. So maybe you might reconsider giving your child the MMR vaccine, despite the fact that you might have had it. All of your siblings might have had it. Your parents might. No, maybe not parents. Maybe if they're old enough, your parents might have had it. All of your friends might have had it. And none of them have autism. But still, you see this article. Maybe you start thinking what we can see from this one is this is a graph taken looking at the impact of the article. Now, the yellow bars, that is the people who are taking the MMR vaccine. So you can see from when the article was released, we can see a steady decline in the uptake of the vaccine up until about 2003, 2004. And then beyond that point, again, we're still looking at slowly climbing as a lot of work was done by doctors, by the government to try and reassure people that Andrew Wakefield was talking out of his bottom. OK, but what you can also more alarmingly see is the blue line is the confirmed cases of measles, mumps and rubella. OK, so that is the three things that MMR is supposed to protect against. 
and you can see we were at near eradication in 1997 to 2000, but the effect of that dropping vaccine uptake caused huge spikes. Basically, we went under our immunity threshold, and the second that that happened, we got large numbers of outbreaks occurring. Even though it wasn't maybe that many people, say maybe two in 10 people started to refuse the MMR, that had a big impact on everybody else. It's still having an effect, you know, across the world. What we notice here is we've got, this is from 2019, so two years ago, four European nations have lost eradication status. So what that meant was that measles was eradicated. It was considered to be, this is not a disease that this country suffers from, and they've lost that status. The disease has come back. And a lot of misconceptions about measles is that it's a harmless childhood disease. It's not. Is your, your child might survive measles. They might be deaf. They might be disabled. They might not survive it. Okay. What we do know is that they will survive the MMR vaccine. Definitely. And there is no link to autism. I'm going to stress this. There is no link between autism and the MMR vaccine. Okay. It's happening in Scotland. Let's go a little bit closer to home. Again, 2019. If you think this is just a sort of English problem, it's not. It's happening here too. Every now and then there's a little article about a measles outbreak. Hoping to see less of those actually, being as we've got, you know, COVID um, type restrictions probably actually reduce measles outbreaks as a side effect as well, mm. just because less people are seeing each other, fewer, fewer people are seeing each other. So it's important when we're talking about these kind of things that there is a responsibility that everyone has to kind of prevent this kind of thing happening and happening again. Um, so reading this across the way, the researchers, so the researchers are actually still pretty good at doing their job as scientific researchers and doctors and things. They are still doing the right thing. If they are doing their research, they are getting solid data that is reliable and publishing it. And they are still doing that. And that is working. And that's been seen. Kind it doesn't, of well, it doesn't mean you shouldn't COVID. question it. You shouldn't question back and saying, well, where's your data for this? Because they can sometimes mm -hmm. be selective in what they publish. But you should question largely there are like. systems that they have to go through. But once they provide that proof, you should go, OK, then not that just why well, I don't yeah. still believe you. Mm -hmm. Whereas the other two things, these are not being done as well, especially during COVID, we've noticed this has been done pretty poorly. So the media, they have a responsibility to kind of be unbiased and report facts on things. That but is. again, if you um, if you think about COVID, it's not really happened. There's been a lot of a uh, lot of biased and not necessarily completely factually accurate things being posted. And I'm sure you've all seen various different things and been like, well, that's baloney, basically. And also the community, like we all have a responsibility to actually get vaccinated and to get the vaccine to help protect others like that's the whole point of COVID now is we're saying get vaccinated so as you don't give it to your gran or your parents or your friends or whoever that is a community thing and again people aren't doing that people aren't getting the vaccine they're saying no and all that's doing is putting everyone else in the world at risk because they are not doing that. Well, if you think about the people with the underlying health conditions as well they might not be able to get the vaccine I imagine they would want to they'd be like yes first in line please stick me in the arm but they can't get it because of their health condition and so they're just supposed to run the gauntlet of possibly infected humans that's not fair. Yeah. Okay so why are new vaccines needed this is a question that's often asked it's like if you get the flu vaccine why do you need a new one a new one um, and the reason for this is because the virus has the ability to become unrecognizable to the immune system this again with COVID is something we're a bit worried about is if COVID keeps mutating at some point, uh, our immune systems, even if it's seen it before, it might become unrecognizable to it. And now it, the, re the way that um, vaccines, not vaccines, the way that the diseases do this is through something called antigenic variation. So antigenic variation, it kind of does what it says on the tin in terms of it's to do with your antigens and its variation. But your, your B and T lymphocytes, which we talked about a couple of videos ago now, so if you forgot about them, go back and check what they are. But basically, they recognise a pathogen by its antigen, so they know what its antigen is like. And if that antigen has changed, they won't be able to recognise it. It's like, you know what your friend looks like, but if they changed their hair and got on your face, you wouldn't know them because they look different. It would be a bit weird, but... It happens. Um, so some pathogens actually have the ability to evolve uh, different antigens. So they manage to evolve their antigens so as they look different. So our immune system can no longer then actually identify that disease. And if you look at these two pictures, they show the same pathogen. But the difference is they are up over different years. And you can see very clearly they are different. They look different. So our body, which maybe may have been able to recognize the one on the left and say, yep, you know what? That's that's a virus. I know how to deal with that comes along as the second version of it where it's had this uh, variation which has allowed it to kind of modify its antigens 
now we can't recognise it, so we can't fight it off, and your body's a bit screwed, essentially, thinking, well, I've made all these antigens, uh, I know how to fight these antigens, wait a minute, that's not them, I don't know what these are. And it means your immune system has to start from scratch all over again, so you get your first infection, then you've got your B lymphocyte to try and match up with it, then your cloning of the B lymphocyte, and it takes time, and you get infected, and you get sick. Okay, this diagram here just shows that exact effect. So again, the antigens on the outside of the pathogen, in this case, it's a flu virus, and you can see every year the antigens change, and it's the antigens how our immune system recognizes it. So basically, this is the equivalent of it again, getting glasses, shaving its beard off, putting a mustache on, and developing a French accent just to try and really confuse us to who they are. So to summarise this, that is all we need to know about vaccines, those two videos, so it's quite a nice short one, and again, yeah. it's quite relevant to life right now. Yeah. Um, but things you need to know from this one is, first of all, problems with the vaccination programme, so obviously expenses, so places that are uh, got high poverty levels might not manage to get the vaccines, uh, and also anti-vaxxers, people who are saying no to getting vaccines, that's quite a big issue in a vaccination programme. I'm going to say how proud I am of myself for not going on a huge, I know I'd, I'd had a mini rant there, but I can talk well. about this for about four hours and get a lot more rude about the people involved as well. So I'm going to say but I'm proud won't. of myself for that one. Antigenic variation is the science bit, uh, the ability of the pathogen to change its antigens on the outside of its membrane and become unrecognisable to the immune system, which is why we need possibly new vaccines for stuff every year, every five years, every 10 years uh, due to anti -vari antigenic variation. So that's it for key area seven. Uh, I think it was a nice short one. And again, in terms of the one amount more. of content, quite small. We've got one more video left and it's a lovely short key area about clinical trials. So again, highly relevant uh, to the situation right now because we're obsessed with clinical trials mm -hmm. and robust and reliable uh, information, which I'm kind of loving, except for the you know, whole pandemic side of it, yeah. and people dying and you know, quality of that situation. But other than that, for the science, lovely. It's a teaching, <laughs> it's a teaching method, really yeah. useful. Yeah. yeah, anywho, see you in the yeah. next one. Okay, bye.